So now we're going to talk about authentication and specifically something you know how to use uh, that aspect of authentication. Now, uh, the first thing we're going to cover is proof of knowledge, uh, since a very general aspect of it, not the, in the cryptographic sense, although it's uh, related. The second part we're going to cover is uh, guessing secrets, uh, because uh, we want to prove knowledge of secrets. And then uh, there is uh, an important aspect is how, how easy these are to guess and how you can guess them, or rather how to verify your guesses. Which uh, brings us into to online and offline uh, attacks and uh, the differences there. And related to, uh, to this is, of course, also how to store these secrets. Uh, because if someone can get access to that storage, it should still be difficult to get the secrets. Yes, it would be nice to have some way to verify the secrets without having the secrets uh, being uh, readable in, in plain text. So we'll talk a bit about that. But let's talk about start with the proof of knowledge. So the idea of something you know is that uh, we have this prover and this verifier, and the prover must verify uh, must convince the verifier that he knows some secret. And uh, the classical approach to this is uh, the password. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, the prover and the verifier share a secret value. And the prover simply tells the verifier the value. And then the verifier is convinced that, OK, yes, he told me the correct secret. So he must be who he claims to be, for instance, Bob in this case. Um, and uh, if the adversary would happen to uh, learn this secret, he can convince the verifier that he is the prover. And uh, this is, of course, uh, not particularly good. And there are various ways the adversary might learn the secret. For instance, the adversary might overhear the conversation. So if you say it orally, then yes, he can hear it if he's in the vicinity. Or he might be able to read your uh, network traffic so he'll, he can see the password uh, when it's sent over the network. Uh, the adversary might be able to trick the prover to reveal the secret, for instance, through phishing attacks. And the adversary might simply be able to guess the secret because the secret is not uh, chosen uh, that randomly. So let's talk about uh, the last part, guessing secrets uh, a bit more. So the idea is here that we have this secret X, uh, which is chosen from some probability distribution and the probability of guessing uh, this secret correctly is uh, this. Now the question is, what is the probability distribution? Uh, because that one depends. Uh, so for instance, if we take the example of cryptographic keys, the distribution is uh, very close to the uniform uh, distribution. Uh, if not exactly the uniform distribution, uh, it is very, very close. So this means that the probability of uh, X being chosen as the secret is one over N. Uh, if uh, the random variable X here can take N possible values. So that is all the possible uh, cryptographic keys that can be chosen. Uh, so N is the size of the uh, key space. And uh, usually in cryptography, uh, usually one takes n as 2 to the power of 128. Uh, that is what is usually called 128-bit security. Uh, so 256-bit uh, security is also uh, common uh, for, for more secure 
applications. Now, when it comes to passwords, now those secrets are distributed uh, in a different way because there are many factors that uh, affect the password. For instance, it's the individual who tries to choose the password, the situation in which the individual chooses the password, password policies that uh, might affect the choice and so on. And uh, this means that uh, if we look at the cryptographic keys, then the probability distribution will look like this. Uh, which means that it's all uniform. So the, the key that we are uh, after as an adversary uh, might be anywhere here in the spectrum. However, if we look at, um, if we look at uh, passwords, that distribution is not uniformly random uh, usually. It will more likely look something like this, uh, where it has peaks here and there. Because, for instance, uh, no password will probably occur here because maybe in this, uh, this space there, there are no uh, characters that are typable on a keyboard, so they will uh, not be in the password, whereas uh, that is irrelevant to a cryptographic key. You don't have to type it on, on the keyboard. So that will uh, affect. And then uh, various other things will also affect uh, a user's choice of passwords. There, there are uh, large studies about uh, how, to, how users uh, choose their uh, passwords and what uh, password distribution uh, what, what probability distribution that uh, yields. So we'll get to that in a moment. So uh, for guessing passwords, it's a good idea to find a way to approximate the distribution uh, so that you, uh, you try to follow these peaks and not just random guessing as if it was a cryptographic key because that will be far too inefficient. So uh, one uh, example here of just basic guessing is that most humans would, would use uh, words as a base uh, for their passwords. And maybe in some cases it is simply a word as the, as the, the word password itself entails. And uh, then it's of course a good idea to use uh, dictionaries of words to uh, as a starting point for your guesses. And then simply you, you adapt these guesses to the password policy and so on uh, to, to form these guesses. Uh, you can improve uh, this by simply using leaked passwords as guesses. Then uh, uh, maybe you actually have the, the actual password in the password database because many people reuse their passwords across services. So even if your password database is leaked from one service, the user might actually reuse it from another service. And many users should choose the same passwords uh, as each other uh, because people are very bad at uh, choosing randomly. Another uh, aspect is to, to take grammar into account. So for uh, more difficult to guess uh, past phrases, then uh, humans have a tendency to adapt to grammar. And uh, that, of course, uh, will aid guessing. Another way is to simply use uh, machine learning uh, and uh, run a machine, train a machine learning algorithm on leaked password databases. And then you can simply generate, uh, let the algorithm generate a list of password looking uh, guesses. So then you, then you can have variations that are not in the, uh, not in the password data, the leaked password database, but, uh, that uh, still has the same look as normal passwords. So, so that, that might actually uh, get you a, a few more uh, passwords uh, that you can guess. Now, 
this uh, this is of course uh, everything I've said so far is of course relevant when the user has chosen a password however in many situations that's not the case so for instance there are a lot of devices which has uh, default passwords so for instance home routers and uh, 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 surveillance cameras which are connected uh, over the internet and uh, things like that and uh, there was this incident with the Mirai botnet which uh, was infecting primarily surveillance cameras and home routers and uh, what they did was uh, what this botnet did was to attempt uh, default passwords of various manufacturers and some other uh, vulnerabilities in in their uh, software and uh, spread to 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 expand the botnet to a lot a lot of uh, devices and then uh, this botnet uh, made the the largest distributed denial of service attack uh, up until uh, that time and uh, by that i mean that all these uh, devices in the botnet uh, tried to connect to a certain or send data to a certain uh, address or server uh, at the same time and thus overloading uh, that system now uh, these default passwords of course they since they are default passwords and people have a tendency to not change them then they of course have a very high probability of uh, being the correct password so that's a good good guess to use so one idea uh, to try to improve password security is to automatically generate passwords for users uh, and um, this would of course yield a uniform distribution so it should be really difficult uh, to guess these passwords but on the other hand uh, we have the usability aspect in this case which um, says that uh, these passwords will also be very hard for humans to remember uh, depending on how they are designed uh, remember we talked about uh, choosing four words at random compared to choosing 10 characters at random and uh, they gave uh, roughly the same amount of entropy but one was considerably much easier to remember uh, than the other so this is uh, not a problem uh, to to do for a home router because there you can simply uh, generate a random password and put a sticker on it and that is perfectly fine and uh, in offices having uh, automatically generated passwords which are not easy to remember that will most likely make these passwords end up on post-its uh, somewhere uh, which is of course bad because the adversary can just take a walk and peek into the offices and will uh, get these passwords another uh, very common probably the most common way to try to increase the security of the user's chosen passwords is a password policy and this means to introduce rules uh, to try to affect how users choose the passwords. For instance, require upper and lower case, numbers and special characters. Probably you're very familiar with this. And uh, then the passwords look a bit more random. Uh, however, they are still chosen by humans. And uh, research has actually shown that uh, this is a bad idea. So there is a paper that uh, researches this and shows that uh, they, they estimated the distribution, so the entropy uh, of uh, the password, the, the set of passwords chosen by users under various policies. And they concluded that it's better to only have a uh, required length, uh, minimum length and uh, that gave much better uh, passwords actually. Uh, another uh, bad idea which is commonly practiced is password aging. 
this means that passwords age and expire and then users must change them at uh, regular intervals uh, so the the idea of uh, this is that if it takes uh, six months to to guess a password uh, meaning you you can have uh, rather unsecure passwords and then you change the password every three months uh, then it's supposedly uh, more difficult to guess this but uh, this is also a bad idea uh, it simply reduces the security of uh, the passwords chosen by users and uh, the users simply introduce systems uh, to try to remember their passwords uh, when they have to change them uh, too often. So either they end up on a post-it note or the users uh, find a system uh, for it. So like appending a one, two, three, or appending the year or appending the month or a combination uh, of them uh, to try to get around this system. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, a standards document which actually has recommendations on uh, how to deal with uh, uh, passwords and what policies you should set. Uh, so it's uh, summarized in, in uh, this document. You'll see the reference later. Uh, it's published by NIST, so the National Institute of Standardizations and Technology. And uh, they currently recommend that you, you, you have as a password policy to have at least 10 characters and uh, no requirement about special characters or uppercase and lowercase and so on. And uh, you do not force renewal unless there has been a security breach. Uh, so that's the current recommendation. And that is uh, founded in, in research. Uh, which the uppercase, lowercase, special characters type of policy, that one was very much not founded in, in research uh, many, many years ago. Uh, now, the, the last aspect of, of this uh, is whether uh, the adversary can do online or offline attacks. Now, the in the online case, uh, the adversary must interact with the system for each guess. So for instance, uh, guessing the password of a Google account, then you must submit each guess to Google. Uh, so this allows uh, Google to see whenever the adversary makes a guess. And uh, the Opposite is uh, an offline attack where the adversary can simply verify the guess himself. So for instance, uh, guessing the password of an encrypted file. So if the adversary has uh, a copy of the encrypted file, he can simply uh, guess a password and try to decrypt. And if it works, then he knows it was the correct password. If it doesn't work, uh, then he will make another guess. And he can continue like this as much as he likes and there is nothing anyone can do about it. So that's the offline case. Now, one idea uh, for uh, the online case is to, to do rate limiting, which simply means that uh, since you have to interact with the system, so uh, Google was the one in our example, then Google can simply see that, okay, now we're getting a, a login attempt for this account. Now we get another login account for a login attempt for this account. So let's uh, slow this down so that we only allow one attempt per second instead of a thousand attempts per second. Now this uh, would slow guessing down by a factor of thousand. Uh, which is a uh, considerable uh, amount. So, so this can be uh, really helpful. So, so this works very well for uh, targeted attacks where the adversary wants uh, to get into a specific account. Uh, so then uh, he can uh, 
then when he wants to focus on, on one particular account, then he's slowed, get, slowed down uh, considerably. Uh, there are, of course, the, the other aspect um, of this is that it also introduces a possibility for denial of service. So for instance, uh, in the example I just gave, there you simply allowed one guess per second, which isn't that much uh, waiting time. I know of other uh, policies, for instance, the one uh, that is at uh, my own uh, university, there they lock the account for 30 minutes after three failed attempts. And obviously that uh, introduces a denial of service uh, quite severely because if someone uh, wants to lock me out of my account, they, they make three wrong guesses and then I am locked out for 30 minutes unless I call help desk and ask them to, to unlock it. So think a bit uh, about this scenario for uh, a few moments. So how will rate limiting affect these two uh, scenarios? So the first one is that uh, for each user, we try every password uh, that we have in our uh, guess list and then we try to log in whether in uh, whereas in the other case here for every password that we have in our uh, password list we try that password for every user in the system yeah. so take a few moments to think about how rate limiting would affect uh, these two scenarios. Would it have an effect or, or, or not? Uh, when does it have an effect and when doesn't, does it not? Now, uh, one aspect of this is that maybe the adversary doesn't care about which user he gets access to. Uh, because getting uh, into one user's account, that's a nice stepping stone uh, for an adversary who wants to attack a system. So this means that if a password is common, then it's likely that some user has chosen it. And if the adversary tries one password for each user, that might not trigger the rate limiting because the, the rate limiting is usually done on a per user basis. But if you just make one attempt for every user, you never trigger this rate limiting. And you, so in the case of that they lock the accounts down, uh, that won't be, be triggered. Uh, so this way the, the adversary can guess uh, without triggering the rate limiting and maybe the adversary can get into one of these uh, accounts. And once in, in uh, in one of these accounts, then the adversary can uh, use that account as the new base within the system and try to uh, compromise other accounts uh, with more privileges and so on. Now, as a final remark here for the, the offline case, uh, consider uh, data which is encrypted with a password. Now here we cannot change the password for data which is already stolen. We cannot limit the number of attempts either because the adversary has the data and there is no way we can uh, control what the adversary does with the data. So the only thing that we have to play with here is the guessability of the password uh, that we had set when the data was uh, stolen. So now uh, let's continue to the uh, to the next uh, the final uh, part, and that's how to store these secrets. So, for instance, the user can store the secret uh, in its mind. So this is assumed as not uh, accessible to third party parties uh, at the moment. Uh, we'll see what uh, technology brings if you can read off brain waves or something in the future. But for now, it's supposedly secure in there. Uh, now, the verifier, on the other hand, is a machine. And the verifier must verify what the prover says. 
And this means that a verifier must have some data to check against. And the question is, how should this data be stored? Because uh, for unlike the human brain, for a machine, we can usually access parts of it. And maybe in some cases, we can ac access uh, more things than we actually should. So we, we need to consider how to store these uh, secrets. Now, the concern here is that someone might actually get into uh, this machine and read this data, and this happens all the time. So uh, this data would, in that case, uh, either help approximate the distribution for, for guessing uh, passwords in general, or simply reveal the passwords uh, of the, the system, uh, which might not be so interesting because if the uh, adversary has already gotten into the system, he has access to that system, but it helps uh, guessing passwords uh, in other systems at least. Uh, for instance, I said before that password reuse is quite widespread. So getting a list of passwords for various users from one system uh, will probably be beneficial for attacking another system. Now, the solution for passwords is that, yeah, we want to uh, compare user entered and stored passwords. So the, the user enters a password that is gives it to the machine and the machine knows the password, which means that the machine has it stored somewhere. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we simply do a irreversible one-way transformation on both. So using hash, hash functions that we talked about uh, in the, during the cryptography session. Now, then these two would still be comparable. It's just that, once you have just the, the hash value of something, you cannot get back to the pre-image, uh, as we said. So it's easy to go one way, but very difficult to go the other way. And uh, as an example of how to do this, so consider that edge is a one-way function or hash function. Then whenever we register uh, a new account, we and the user sets the password we simply store the hash value of the password and uh, then uh, when the user authenticates the user submits uh, password p prime here and then we simply check if hash of p prime is equal to hash of p because if p are the same then uh, they should get the same result when we evaluate the hash function so then we should get an equality. And we know that, yeah, there are poss possible collisions for uh, uh, hash functions, but the probability of finding such collisions is very, very, very uh, small. That, that comes from the, from the one-wayness property of the, the hash function. So if we get an equality, we can be very sure that it is actually the, the correct password. Now, consider guessing here again. Uh, the password space is rather small and uh, we only need to evaluate a, a subset of uh, the possible input space to the hash function. and uh, with faster computers, we can guess a lot. So if we get a list of these uh, hashes, we can simply uh, make a guess, run it through the hash, and we see if we get a hit uh, to find the password. So this is an offline attack uh, that we can do. If we get hold of this list, then we can guess as much as we like until we find the passwords. So, a solution to, to this problem is to choose a hash uh, function which is slow to compute. So for instance, that you iterate it 10,000 times over itself, or uh, simply use a lot of slow calculations uh, in this hash function. Uh, so this will uh, slow guessing attacks down. And depending on how difficult uh, we make this guessing yeah it slows uh, slows the guessing down by by such a factor 
Now, if we get a list of password hashes uh, like this, then if two uh, users has the same password hash, then most likely they have the same password as well, uh, which means that we can uh, see if uh, how many users have the same password and then pick the the pass, pass and try to guess the password that most users have. Uh, but actually it also allows us to guess uh, all the passwords at once. Because if we have this list, we can uh, make a guess, we compute the hash, we check if the hash matches any user's password. And if it does, then we know that, okay, this user has this password so we can use that one for logging in. So this is the, the same situation that the adversary might not be interested in a particular user, but any user in the system. And then uh, this speeds up guessing uh, quite a lot, especially if there are many users in the system. So a solution to, to this problem is to add a salt. Uh, and uh, this is simply a small random value, so roughly 128 bits is common to use. And it's unique for each user. So whenever we create the account for the user, we randomly choose 128-bit salt. And uh, that's quite some space. So it's uh, very, very unlikely that two users will get the same salt. And then we simply uh, add this salt uh, to the hash. So the salt isn't secret at all. Uh, it's just to destroy this uh this uh, property that two users with the same hash uh, or two users with the same password will have the same hash uh, so that's all it does but we can store it in plain text uh, along with the password hash for instance uh, so once we've added salt then all hashes will be unique no matter if the passwords are the same so this will uh, force the adversary to guess uh, for each user. Uh, it also uh, prevents a lot of other techniques like rainbow tables where you pre-compute uh, a lot of these uh, things because the 128 bits of uh, salt will uh, explode the, the space uh, needed for uh, storing all of this. Uh, as I said, the salt is not secret. It simply adds uniqueness to each its, uh, each hash. And uh, it can be stored in, in plain text along with the password hash. So nothing secret about the salt. Now, uh, there are a lot of various libraries which implement a lot of these hash functions to use for passwords. So for instance, bcrypt uh, is a... Uh, very well known uh, library for this available in, in most systems. Uh, Argon2 is another one uh, which is more recently proposed, uh, developed uh, or chosen uh, in a competition held by the Passwords Conference and uh, they should be available in, in most languages and libraries so, so these can uh, be used securely uh, whenever you, you need to store passwords. And that was everything I wanted to say for this time. Uh, thanks a lot.